The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. My name is Lee Pucker. I'm the CEO of the Wireless Innovation Forum, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on CBRS Enhanced Features and Self-Testing. Uh, a few administrative notes before we get started. The slides today uh, will be available in the handouts and are going to be posted on our webinars page. It's wirelessinnovation.org slash webinars. Uh, we're doing a recording of today's session and you'll be able to get that on our YouTube channel. Um, and just contact us if you, if you want the link. And finally, if you have any questions related to the webinar uh, or uh, and how to access the materials, please contact me at lee.pucker at wirelessinnovation.org and we'll get you that information. Uh, today for questions, there's a questions window. If you could type your questions in there, then we'll go ahead and uh, review those and, and hand them off to the speakers. Uh, so please use your questions window uh, to add questions and go ahead and feel free to ask those as we go. Uh, we won't be doing questions till the end of each session, but we'll, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll be reviewing and, and queuing up your questions as we go. So with that, I'd like to introduce today's moderator. Uh, the moderator today is Richard Bernhardt. Richard is the National Spectrum Advisor for the Wireless Internet Service Providers Association, the co-chair of the Wireless Innovation Forum Spectrum Sharing Committee, and the chair of the CBRS Operations Work Group. So Richard, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Lee, and welcome everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. We have a wonderful webinar for you today. We're gonna to cover a lot of their territory. Um, if you, as Lee said, if you have questions uh, throughout the webinar, please enter them into the questions section. We'll do our best to answer some of those questions either during the presentation or at the end when we have a Q&A session. We have a number of speakers for you today, some uh, important items to go over. The agenda is on the screen. Um, we will begin by going over the um, release two protocols. Um, and that will be presented by Andy Clegg from, or Andrew Clegg from uh, Google. He is the Spectrum Engineering Lead for Google, and he will go through uh, the various aspects of protocol and give us an overview um, to set the tone for all of the other people who are going to present today. Next, we're going to go over the features and functions that are supported under the protocol. Uh, Naveen Hathramani from Nokia, he's a, a senior standardization specialist for Nokia. We'll present that. Um, again, if you have questions along the way, let us know. Um, he will segue into self-testing, a very important portion of release two, um, and, and that'll be presented by Virgil Simpu from uh, Ericsson, and we'll get an overview of how you approach that. And then we wanna break it down um, very specifically by the two very important aspects of CBRS, the devices themselves, the CBSDs, and self-testing um, of the CBSDs will re be presented by Edan Raz, who's an interoperability lead for Airspan. Um, and uh, then we'll round out the discussion with a look from the SAS's perspective on self-testing by Masood Olfat, who's the Vice President of Technology Development for Federated Wireless. At that point, we'll also have another Q&A session. So if you have questions uh, that you think of along the way and they don't come up uh, in, in a fashion that we can use during the discussion, there will also be a Q&A session. Um, so let's uh, kick things off. I wanna introduce, um, Andrew Clegg from Google. He'll begin by providing us with information about uh, the protocols. Andy, why don't you kick us off? All right, thanks Richard, thanks very much. Um, so we're actually, uh, before we get into the details of the protocols, uh, what I'll be introducing is the features that those protocols um, enable. Um, and uh, we'll do that in the context of uh, what we refer to as release two, of uh, the CBRS, uh, features and functionality. So if we go to the next slide, please, Lee. So um, the release one specifications for CBRS are in our technical spec 0112, which you can get on the WinForm website. It's free to download uh, by anybody. And those were the original specifications upon which spectrum access systems were certified uh, starting a uh, you know, almost two years ago or two years ago. Um, 
And so those are what all SASs are operating by today. So what's described in TSO 112 is what SASs are doing uh, today. Um, now, after we finished uh, 0112, we embarked upon what we call release two, and that is um, features and requirements that allow us to evolve beyond uh, what were used for certification uh, for, the, for the first, for the baseline uh, standard TSO 112. Um, so we're introducing new features that SASs can support. Um, and these features represent uh, you know, our path to innovation and evolution of uh, how SASs uh, operate in the future. Um, a key feature of release two is that the technical spec is uh, very easy to extend. So basically there's a front piece of the technical spec um, that describes sort of the, the, the very minimum requirements you need to meet for release two. And then the release two features themselves are all in separate annexes. And anybody can contribute a, a, an annex as a proposed release two feature. The benefit of that is that if you want to add another feature, you just submit an annex uh, for inclusion. Or if you need to modify a feature, you simply have to edit that one annex. And so when the document goes back out to be validated and approved by the membership, you only have to concentrate on that one annex that was added or, or modified. Uh, the rest of the document, the rest of the release two standard stays the same. Uh, so it's, it's compartmentalized and makes it very easy to extend uh, the features. Um, so now there are, in release two, there are certain features that do not uh, impact our protection of protected entities. So there are features that have no bearing on whether the DOD is properly protected or whether a, a grandfathered wireless protection zone is protected or a fixed satellite service dish is protected um, or a priority access license is protected. There are some aspects that have no bearing whatsoever, whatsoever on interference protection for protected entities. Um, and we, we call those non-regulatory impacting uh, features. And a given feature could actually be used in a manner that does impact regulatory protections or does not. So it just depends on how you, you implement a particular feature. So uh, the features that are non-regulatory impacting are things that SASs, we, we, you know, our position is that SASs could deploy today uh, because they have no bearing on the protections that, that the SASs were originally certified for uh, by the government. Um, Going forward, if we wanted to implement some release two features that might impact protections or have other, any other kind of regulatory impact, um, there is a, a, a concept that we've put together for how we would certify those uh, to, to convince the government, the FCC, that the SAS is doing what it needs. And Virgil will talk more about that certification process uh, later on. So what I've provided in the next few slides is just a very high level overview of the current release two features. So if you go to the TS-1001 document on our website, these are the features that are currently incorporated in there. There's a whole list of other features that we're working on, but I'll concentrate today just on the ones that have been adopted in TS-1001 and, uh, and approved for publication. So we'll do a quick overview of those. Um, so next slide, please, Lee. So the, the only release two feature that's required, if you wanna be a release two spectrum access system or a release two CBSD, the only uh, feature that's required is capability exchange. This is basically the method by which a SAS and a CBSD communicate to each other, telling them that they support release two and here are the specific features of release two they support. So not every SAS has to support every release two feature because everything is optional other than this one right here, capability exchange. And not every CBSD has to support every release two feature. The only mandatory feature a CBSD for release two has to support is this capability exchange. And so in order for a SAS and a CBSD to understand what each other supports, they've got to have this capability exchange built into themselves. Uh, in order to be released too. And I apologize for the construction noise now, of course, uh, good timing. 
Um, but uh, uh, if there's a fallback position of a CBSD communicates to a SAS uh, and they don't ex uh, understand the capability exchange, then they fall back to release one. So that's the default. If, 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 if the CBSD and the SAS don't understand each other, they fall back to release one. So let's go to the next slide, please, Lee. I apologize for the uh, construction noise. Um, give me one second. So um, one of the uh, big features that we've adopted in uh, release two has to do with grouping. Um, essentially what we've done is we found ways for um, the SAS, for CBSDs to identify each other uh, as members of a, of a particular group. And this is useful in various situations, which I'll get into shortly, um, that uh, you need to identify that a SAS needs to understand that a particular CBSD is part of a group. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of information and a lot of optional standards in, in release two that have uh, to do with, uh, with grouping. So let me go through the grouping related features um, in release two. Um, so the first one is uh, enhanced CBSD group handling. So that's uh, essentially a baseline feature that allows SASs and CBSDs to understand the concept of grouping so that a CBSD can communicate to the SAS that it's part of a group and the SAS can understand that grouping. So that's sort of the baseline group uh, feature requirement uh, or optional feature in um, release two. So um, one of the release two features that makes use of the, the enhanced group handling is principal and subordinate single frequency group. Um, what this is, is for example, if you have a rural broadband deployment and you have a centralized CBSD and it's communicating with a CBSD that is a customer premise equipment, CPE, that's at somebody's home, and in order for those two CBSDs to communicate to each other so you can provide internet service to the home, they need to be on a, the same frequency all of the time. And so you will have a way to communicate to the SAS that those two CBSDs are part of a group and they need to be kept on the same frequency in order uh, for the connection to work. Um, <laughs> there is, um, there is a somewhat similar feature called the interdependent single frequency group um, where if you have a set of CBSDs that are required by their hardware to operate on the same frequency, uh, so for example, a, a distributed LTE network that operates as one, you know, one network for roaming between cell, uh, neighboring cell sites and things, they can all identify themselves to the SAS as being an interdependent single frequency group. Um, and one of the features there is that if all the members of the group cannot be accommodated on a particular frequency, then none of the members receive a grant. So it's all or nothing. Uh, separable frequency group, uh, the next feature down, is, is similar to the interdependent frequency group, but basically if an individual member cannot uh, change frequency, for example, or can't accept a particular power level, then the others can still continue on um, but the individual CBSDs that can't use that frequency due to interference uh, restrictions or whatever, um, those can be denied grants. So, so you basically are able to, to separate out the CBSD. Um, and it's important to remember that these groups have nothing to do with interference protection, protection for protected entities. Um, you don't get any special consideration if you're a member of a group. It just allows a SAS to treat a group of CBSDs um, together uh, in order to achieve the, the desired uh, functionality of that group of CBSDs. So, so that's a lot of grouping um, material in, in release two standards, um, and that's a, a very quick high-level uh, overview. Uh, next slide, please, Lee. So we've also built in an enhanced antenna pattern capability in release two. Um, in release one, we only use the azimuth beam pattern of antennas for interference protection. Um, but in reality, if you're using down tilt or if there's a big vertical angle between, you know, a CBSD and a potential uh, victim, you know, uh, protected entity or something, uh, you could get a better prediction of interference capability if you also included the vertical pattern of the antenna. And uh, 
in fact, what we want to do is go to full 2D antenna patterns. That is, uh, azimuth and elevation are both taken into account uh, in the antenna gain calculation. So that's not in release one. Release two um, has a, a fair amount of material in order to implement uh, 2D antenna patterns, um, which we think will open up more spectrum um, because uh, if you just use the azimuth pattern, you're always assuming essentially the worst case because you're not including vertical discrimination. So, so we've incorporated formulas for implementing enhanced, enhanced antenna patterns in release two. Um, the, we are working with the FCC to refine what we've done in release two on enhanced antenna patterns, and we expect the implementation to change uh, somewhat. So what's in there now, uh, if you review it, keep in mind that it's likely to change uh, in the not too distant future as we work with the FCC. Uh, next slide, please, Lee. So uh, one sort of very basic uh, uh, feature in release two is that if you are a CPE CBSD, a customer premise equipment CBSD, um, you can provide that indication to the SAS um, and CPE CBSDs are allowed to bootstrap their registration through another CBSD because they may not have internet connection themselves. Uh, the CPE CBSD is not afforded any special uh, treatment uh, with regard to interference uh, protection for protected entities, uh, but it is useful for the SAS to know that a particular CBSD is operating as, as a CBE, CPE CBSD, um, and it does in fact have to meet all the requirements of a CPE CBSD as laid out in release one. And then uh, next slide, please, Lee. Finally, we have in release two uh, support for passive DAS. Uh, so uh, in this situation for passive DAS, um, a central radio unit uh, basically provides signals to multiple access points. So you're basically just physically splitting the radio signal off and sending it to a variety of, of uh, transmission points we call TPs. Um, and so the antennas are at each of these transmission points, and we treat each of those antennas as an individual CVSDs. Uh, so members of that chain of transmission points declare uh, themselves to the SAS as a member of a uh, uh, of a uh, of a passive DAS, and they do that uh, if you recall back through the enhanced group handling features. So they identify themselves as a member of a group that is a passive DAS. Uh, all of the CBSDs in a passive DAS group must be professionally installed, regardless of whether they're category A or B. Right now, the rules technically only require professional installation of category B, but because of the nature of passive DAS and the importance to understand what you're doing, um, we've required that all passive DAS components uh, have to be in professionally installed. Um, and all of the members of a passive DAS must be granted the same frequencies, which makes sense because all you're doing is splitting the signal from the, from the central radio unit off into a bunch of transmission points. Um, and then if one member of a passive DAS is not authorized to transmit due to interference concerns, all of the other CBSDs must cease transmission uh, within 60 seconds. So it's kind of an all or nothing thing. You have to bring down the whole DAS if there's an interference issue or, or a projected interference issue. So that is uh, uh, a quick uh, overview of the features that are currently in our, our release two specification. More are on the way and um, stay tuned and we'll probably have a webinar in a few months and go over the next ones. Great, uh, thank you, Andy. And then it's a good overview of um, the early features and functions that are coming in release two. Um, there were a couple of quick questions. I'll get to them really quickly because we're uh, gonna go on to our next subject. You mentioned uh, non-regulatory impacting and regulatory impacting. Uh, do I have to make a decision as a user about those and um, how do they impact what the SAS does? So no, we've, we've split them off into those categories to determine whether um, a particular feature used in a particular way would require FCC certification. And so that's on the SAS. The SAS has to get certified for implementing it in a particular way. So no, it's not on the user, it's on the SAS. It's between the SAS and the regulator to get approval for using certain features in certain ways that may be regulatory impacting. 
And if I am interested in adding a group, is there a way to do that? I saw that there's a one called single frequency group. Is there other other groups and how, to, how can they go about being added? So the best way to do that is to discuss with your SAS administrator and they will uh, walk you through the process for, for handling, uh, handling groups. All right. Uh, we'll have some more questions at the end, but thank you for your presentation. We're going to move on now to uh, Naveen Hathramani from Nokia. Uh, uh, Naveen is a standardization specialist who works um, with WinForum extensively. He also runs the protocols working group. Um, Naveen is going to go over uh, self-testing overview, or excuse me, he's going to go over the uh, protocols support features and uh, give us an understanding of how Release 2 operates in that respect. So I'm going to hand it off now to Naveen. Welcome. Thank you, Richard. So we can move on to the next slide. So uh, Andy provided an overview of the Release 2 requirements. Over here, what we're going to see in this section is uh, the protocol aspects that are needed to enable those the use of those features. So just like uh, Andy mentioned, all release one is a baseline, and that is what's been certified, and that's according to the Part 96 rules. All release two specifications are enhancements and uh, or extensions, as we call them here. And the extensions for the SAS to CBSD interface are included in TS3002, and the extensions for the TS uh, for the SAS to SAS interface are included in TS3003. So the implementation of these release two specifications are all optional. In order to support these release two uh, specifications and features, the two policy documents uh, have been developed. One is to allow for proprietary features to be developed. And the other one is for collecting all the different groups that can be used uh, within the grouping framework that we provide in release two. So some of the groups which Andy went over were our WinForum specified groups. You can have groups which are not WinForum specified and you can register their names in, in this policy document SSC 10. One example of such groups which is not specified in WinForum would be the CBRS Alliance coexistence group. Okay, so we go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So release two is all optional. But if you implement release two, there's some mandatory aspects that have to be implemented. So one of those is the feature capability exchange, which Andy already mentioned. So it's mandatory to support this. We will go into how this is used and for what it is used in the next slide. And apart from that, there are some other mandatory requirements, and these are on the parameters and the response codes. So uh, there are certain parameters which already existed in release one and they have or response codes which exist in release one and their functionality has been enhanced and these are marked as release two enhancement parameters and all those that are marked as mandatory need to be supported to come to uh, state release to compliance and then the new release two parameters and response codes which are marked as mandatory which also need to be implemented to be able to uh, state release to compliance so all those are detailed in the TS3002. In addition, uh, since the ecosystem is going to have a mix of SAS that supports release one and release two and CBSDs that support release one and release two, we established a backward and forward compatibility principle, which basically sh says that the SAS and CBSD shall only operate in release two mode if both SAS and CBSD support release two. Okay. We move on to the next slide. In any other case, as is shown in the table over there, you would operate in release one. So the feature capability exchange is the only mandatory procedure that needs to be supported. Uh, and over here, what we use this for is to is a method, a vehicle via which the SAS and CBSD can exchange the feature lists uh, IDs which they support. So during registration, a CBSD will include a feature capability list, and that feature capability list will include a list of all the feature IDs it wants to use for operation. This is something we call operationally supported features. And the SAS would receive that list, and it would decide which ones it supports, and it would inform then the CBSD of a common list of features which they can use for operation going forward. 
the feature list IDs, uh, the feature IDs are specified in TS3002 for the ones specified by the Win Forum. But like I mentioned before, third party proprietary features can also be included in this list. There is a possibility that uh, SAS or CBSD uh, include an empty list in this feature capability exchange. And that would just mean that the SAS or CBSD support all the release two mandatory requirements i.e. the new response codes or enhanced response codes or parameters, but they do not support any feature IDs for, uh, at the moment. Uh, the, feature, the features which a SAS or CBSD support can be updated at any time during registered state. So for example, if you've got a CBSD and you decide, oh, I'm gonna turn on this new feature now for operation, then what the uh, CBSD can do, it can initiate this new method, this procedure called the feature capability exchange procedure and send a feature capability exchange, exchange request message to the SAS. And in this message, the CBSD would include all the feature IDs it currently supports operationally and the parameters associated with those features. So this gives a vehicle for CBSD and SAS to update the features they support uh, in registered state. If the SAS updates the, fe the features it supports, it can also uh, request the CBSD to trigger the start of this procedure via a flag in the spectrum inquiry, ground, heartbeat, and re relinquishment procedures. Okay, we move to the next slide. Please, thanks. So this slide kind of summarizes where the differences are in the methods between release one and release two. So it's a very high level summary. And you can see on the first column that uh, most of the methods we use are release one. And the only new method that's introduced in release two is the feature capability exchange, which we just went over. However, the release one methods are enhanced with uh, aspects to uh, enable the features that we have introduced. So in the registration phase, for example, we allow for the feature capability exchange to happen. And then we also allow for enhanced group uh, handling, enhanced antenna pattern, or CPE, CBSD indicator features uh, parameterization to be present. The two parameters which have been enhanced in release two, these are parameters that existed in release one, and they have been enhanced to allow for floating point values also. Before in release one, it was only integer values. And now here we allow for floating point values. I will skip feature capability exchange since we discussed that in the last slide. And then, uh, like I mentioned, uh, since uh, if the SAS needs to update the feature list, inform the CBSD that is supporting new features, or it doesn't want to support a currently supported feature that is being used operationally, what it can do is trigger a flag and that flag uh, can be included in the spectrum inquiry, grant or heartbeat, heartbeat or relinquishment procedures. So when the CBSD in, uh, gets this trigger, it will initiate a feature capability exchange procedure. So that flag is new in those messages. And then uh, we have also uh, added the capability to uh, update anything regarding a group via the enhanced group handling feature in messages outside the res registration. Okay, next slide. Response codes. So uh, another item that was updated were some certain response codes here. This is not a full exhaustive list of all the changes to the response codes in release two. It's just uh, two of the key items, I would say, there's some that were just enhanced. And the two key items are one, the introduction of a new response code, which is 106 not processed. This uh, is used by the SAS to indicate to the CBSD that it may have some processing issues and the current message it, ha it has received has not been processed. And then it's up to the CBSD to decide if it's gonna wait for a while or it's going to, if it's going to send the, resend the same message or it's going to send a different message. It's a, it would be de dependent on the nature of the message also the CBSD sent, the decision taken by the CBSD in that case. And then the other enhancement we have done 
is on the response code zero. So response code zero is the response code the SAS used to indicate to the CBSD that the uh, procedure it initiated was uh, performed successfully. However, with the introduction of, these, of some of the features we have in release two, there could be cases where the operation was completed successfully, but it wasn't exactly done how the CBSD intended to, for it to be done. And what we do here then is introduce this, the capability of uh, signaling warning messages by response code zero. So the idea here is like, we don't want uh, a registration to fail if there's a minor issue with some parameterization uh, that was performed in the messaging, or, or we don't want a procedure to fail. So what we do, but we do want the end user to know about this issue. So we here we enable these warning messages. An example of this is, for example, the two, a 2D two antenna pattern. If a CBSD registers and employs the 2D antenna pattern, and the SAS will get this 2D antenna pattern information, and it will go to an antenna database where it would try to retrieve this 2D antenna pattern. If it cannot find this 2D antenna pattern, uh, the idea would be not for it to uh, reject the registration. It, the idea would be to use other parameters for the, of that to define the antenna pattern of the CBSD and then use this warning message to warn the CBSD that, hey, there's some issue with the 2D antenna pattern. We couldn't find it in the database. You need to troubleshoot it. So that's the intention behind this. If we move on to the next slide. Thank you. Another aspect to take into account is when moving between release one and release two is the SAS URL. So a SAS may choose to have different URLs for release one and release two, but uh, the smoothest upgrade between release one and release two from CBSD point of view would be if the SAS supports a single URL for release one and release two. Next slide, please. So, so this kind of concludes some of the aspects of uh, TS3002 which is the CBSD to SAS interface. The next two slides, I'm just gonna give a highlight of some of the changes we introduced in TS3003, which takes care of the protocol uh, between SASs. So similarly, as we did for CBSD to SAS, we introduced a feature capability exchange procedure between the SAS, and uh, this will be used by any SAS that is release two or beyond, release one or be, uh, beyond release one. Uh, the feature IDs exchanged within this ex uh, procedure are the ones specified within TS3003 or proprietary features. Now, the uh, difference here within TS3003 is that we differentiate between the regulatory impacting and non-regulatory impacting features. So a SAS could use a feature in a way that's regulatory impacting or non-regulatory impacting. So the list uh, of the features which is exchanged between the SASs is divided between in these two categories. We go to the next slide. And over here, the other change is uh, certain SAS to SAS synchronization procedures, the time range request, by ID request, or push support have been deprecated in release two because they weren't being used by the SAS admins. And there's only the full record dump, which is now being used, which is a pull type request. And this has been enhanced again to support the feature capability exchange. Okay, I think that was my last slide. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you, Naveen. We have a few questions um, around the topics that you presented on protocols and enhanced features. First off, um, do I have to make the decision about whether or not I'm going to inquire about a, um, a feature en enhancement at the time of registration, or can I do some at, uh, at, at a time later on uh, at my choosing? Yeah, so good question. So, I mean, we, we have tried to specify this protocol to allow maximum flexibility. We understand that any CBSD user does not want to relinquish their grant or have to re-register to enable certain features. So we have tried to incorporate maximum flexibility. So if you start off uh, with a set of features, let's say A and B during registration, and then afterwards you decide to incorporate feature C, you can use the feature capability exchange procedure to inform the, the SAS that now you have features A, B, and C 
operationally in use. Okay, so they can make that choice um, pretty much at any time just by asking or doing the proper inquiry to the SAS. Yeah, they, I mean, just to just to be noted, I mean, there may be features that certain SAS vendors may need to know about at the time of registration. So that just so, depends. There may be some implementation dependencies over there. That sort of leads to um, a secondary question around that same uh, subject. You had said that the um, the features and the enhanced features are backwards compatible, and so that SASs will continue to be able to support the baseline standards. Um, what happens if I move from SAS A to SAS B, but SAS B doesn't support all of the features and functions that I'm seeking? You move from, I mean, if SAS B doesn't support, you can only operate with the features that SAS B supports. I mean, you can only have connectivity to one SAS at a time. So you'll have to operate with the features that SAS B supports. So again, the whole feature capability exchange procedure is there to establish a common list of features dynamically in during registration or outside in registered state. It establishes a dynamic list of features which uh, the CBSD and SAS commonly support for operation. But I still will be able to use the the first line uh, release one baseline standards, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Baseline release one is always supported. It's always the fallback option if uh, if your SAS B, for example, doesn't support any release two doesn't even support the mandatory stuff, then you always fall back to release one mode of operation, which is mandatory for everyone. And I guess that pushes the last question that I have here is, is there any way to get my SAS, my managing SAS, to add a feature or functionality that I want? Um, and can they add selectively features and functions or do they have to add all the features and functions at once? Uh, good question. So release two, like I said, everything is optional. So the adoption of the feature capability exchange and those parameters I mentioned in the first slide, though that is mandatory to claim release to compliance. Adoption of any feature outside of that, all the features and dimensions, uh, like the CPE, CBSD indicator, or 2D antenna patterns, that is all optional. So every SAS could choose, pick and choose what they want to implement. And the same goes for the CBSD vendors. So it allows for some flexibility, maybe different SaaS has different approach and new features can be added as, as yeah. they come along. All right, Naveen, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and uh, we'll look back to you again in a few minutes for some additional questions as they may come along. If you think of a question, um, even after a presenter has made a presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section. We'll do our best to address it as we move along. Our next presenter is Virgil Simpu from Ericsson. Uh, Virgil is a standards expert at Ericsson who has worked on CBRS for quite a long time. Uh, in fact, I've, I've known uh, Virgil since we started this process over six years ago. Virgil is gonna give us an overview and a discussion of self-testing. Um, um, and the test and certification process. So let me hand it off to you now, Virgil. Uh, we'll be back with you with a few questions as soon as you're finished. Thank you, Richard. So I'll start just by trying to put uh, a little bit in context uh, where uh, things uh, have ended in regards to uh, WinForm release one test specification. So uh, um, CBRS, it's a special band, it's a spectrum sharing band where uh, three tiers of users have to share the band. So you have a tier one incumbents, tier two priority access user, and then finally the generic access user as tier three. And because of that, uh, there is the spectrum access system who must be used by any device uh, seeking access to the band in order to uh, figure out which frequencies are available to be used in order to guarantee that the higher tier users are protected. Uh, and as such, uh, for any device in, uh, seeking certification to operate in CBRS band, um, the FCC has, uh, uh, has a requirement that the device proves that it's able to uh, interact with the SAS in order to figure out, again, which frequencies are available to, to be used. And um, uh, as part of, of uh, FCC certification, uh, the WinForum release one test specification, uh, specifically the test specification 61, which is uh, referring to SAS as unit under test, and the test specification 122, which is referring to the CBSD, 
or the domain proxy plus EBSD pair, um, uh, they can be used in order to prove to FCC that there is uh, conformance with uh, uh, protocols to interact between the CBSD and the SAS, and uh, and, and and such. Uh, the test labs are required to perform the, uh, the test cases which are described in in the uh, in the test specification for Moon Inform Release One. And on the uh, right side here, I just give an example of a test configuration that can be used by a test lab uh, in order to uh, uh, certify a device as being compliant with WinForum test specification for release one. So you have here the first uh, figure, it's a CBSD as a unit under test, which has to interact with a SAS test harness, which, which is also defined by, by WinForum and it's available in GitHub. And then uh, uh, you can also have to use uh, RF test equipment to prove that uh, the, the CBSD under test does not transmit unless it has been properly authorized by the SAS. And on the right side, uh, there is a, a little bit more elaborate, I would say, test configuration where uh, a CBSD is not tested as standalone, but rather the domain proxy plus CBSD pair is tested. Uh, and, and uh, they, they also have to interact with the test harness and they also uh, need to be, uh, you know, um, be verified by an RF test equipment that the transmission only occurs in the frequencies approved by the SAS test harness. Um, so we can go to the next slide, Lee. So in terms of uh, release two, as uh, mentioned by uh, uh, Andy, and Naveen, um, this feature, the my, my majority of the feature in release two are optional features. And uh, there are two major types of feature, the ones which are non-regulatory impacting, uh, which means they don't impact part 96, they don't impact the incumbent and higher tier user protection. And uh, an example of such features are uh, the feature capability exchange, which is the only mandatory feature in release two. You have an enhanced CBSD group handling, which is used by, to communicate uh, the group uh, membership of CBSD, as well as some uh, parameters which are associated to those groups. Uh, and then you have, uh, as part of those enhanced group, you have principal subordinate sequence frequency group. Uh, and then uh, you have a CP CBSD indicator, which is used to communicate uh, via CBSD that it's uh, operating in CPE mode. And uh, you uh, also have uh, enhanced antenna pattern, uh, but the, for enhanced antenna pattern, as long as it's only used for GA coexistence, then you do not uh, need to impact any of the Part 96 specification. And, and, and as such, uh, uh, it can be classified as a non-regulatory impacted feature. However, if a SAS decides to use the information regarding the enhanced pattern from a CBSD, for incumbent or PAL protection, at that point, that feature becomes regulatory impacted and it will, uh, uh, and uh, it should have to treated differently because at that point it will impact uh, 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 part 96 and the incumbent protection and, and probably FCC would like to verify that uh, uh, the new implementation is compliance with, compliance with part 96. So in terms of certification and testing, these two types of feature uh, will need to be treated separately. And uh, uh, in the next slide, we will uh, go into details how this is handled. So Lee, please, next slide. So uh, I would say the starting point is that uh, you, any device, either, either SAS or CBSD still needs to pass at least one test certification and, and obtain for, for a CBSD obtain an FCC ID. So the FCC, the starting point for release two is that the device has to prove compliance with release one by, by obtaining an FCC certification. And then depending on which feature or features that device uh, supports, where there is a question is, is, is uh, that particular set of feature regulatory impacting or not? If it's regulatory impacted, then the FCC needs to be involved in uh, recertifi recertifying the features which are regulatory impacting. However, if the features are not regulatory impacted, then uh, um, we allow 
uh, industry self-testing uh, to be done to a certain conformance. And this has been done in the spirit of allowing the release two to be very flexible. Uh, so if a device vendor in collaboration with their customer determines that a particular set of features are, are most important for them to be implemented first, they could seek uh, to uh, provide uh, conformance or to to prove to inform conformance with that uh, particular subset of features. And then later on, as uh, maybe more feature or more optional feature are requested by the customer, the device vendor has a possibility to extend the, uh, the set of or, or subset of optional feature that it supports. And then again, reapply uh, for win form with proof that the proper testing has been or self-testing has been done. And um, we'll go into details how, how this can be uh, managed for, uh, again, for the self-testing uh, part. So, uh, Lee, please, next, um, next slide. Yeah, so we'll zoom now into the self-testing for features which are not impacting part 96. And for this, uh, WinForum has uh, put together a self-testing policies for release two. And this is captured in the technical specification 4005. Um, so uh, companies which are uh, seeking to uh, uh, assert conformance with a set of non-regulatory features must agree to the pol policies and procedure for self-testing. And they must uh, prove to WinForum that the testing has been done in accordance to the WinForum test specifications. Um, and uh, so basically, uh, the companies have to follow the test specifications, and this test specification have been developed by uh, Working Group Four in WinForum, which is the Test and Certification Working Group. And uh, uh, Idan and Masood will later on go into much uh, lower level of detail in, in terms of uh, uh, you know how and what kind of testing are covered. Uh, also, the companies have to uh, agree where applicable to use the WinForum test harness, uh, and that test harness is going to be developed also by the working group four. And also, they have to agree to submit uh, in a signed letter uh, uh, the summary of a testing done, including the output of a test harness, uh, and uh, you know, uh, a testing that uh, all test all the uh, mandatory tests were passed uh, before they can uh, assert conformance with a certain uh, subset of optional features. Uh, initially, uh, we WinForum is going to look at uh, feature by feature a case. And so we, if you want to, uh, I would say, um, uh, have a, uh, a compliance or, or a com a conformance uh, um, with a with us particular feature, then it is going to be treated, each feature is going to be treated independently. However, Later on, uh, there is the uh, approach of using a, a bundle of features together for certain use cases. So as, as uh, you add more features, uh, you know, for a particular use case, it might make sense that uh, you, the, the device does not only to have to support one individual feature, but rather a group of features. So once you group of feature in a bundle, in a bundle then uh, you, the, the company can can seek to assert conformance with the entire bundle, not just with one particular feature. And this would be easier then for customer to assert if a certain product is compatible with the use case they plan to uh, deploy. Um, on top of uh, doing the self-testing based on the WinForum list to test specification, it is recommended to do it interoperability testing as well. Uh, however, this interoperability test is non, not required uh, as part as WinForm self-test uh, self policy, uh, but is encouraged. And uh, we uh, assume that entities uh, uh, will, in the ecosystem, will require that uh, such interoperability testing is done as part of uh, uh, their business agreements. And we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of agreement, so uh, so as we already stated, the companies, uh, they have to uh, 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 state uh, that they, they pass the WinForum 
uh, uh, testing specified by working group four. So basically what is required to, uh, as, uh, as part of his agreement with WIM Forum is to sign the agreement uh, when they have to successfully uh, execute the, uh, the test cases where their product is the unit under test and to, in order to demonstrate compliance of a pro product with the subset of features they the subset of optional feature they claim conformance towards and also they have to prove uh, compliance with the mandatory features which uh, in in for win forum release two uh, as uh, both andy and Navin explained it's the only uh, mandatory feature is the uh, feature capability exchange uh, however there are some other I would say aspects which are mandatory in uh, release two protocols. Um, where, where applicable, uh, it is uh, rec uh, recommended and required for the um, for the companies to use the test harness, which are developed by WinForum. Um, and um, uh, then it's they, the companies have to include a declaration. Uh, on the packaging and in any materials related, related to their products where they list the features they uh, claim compliance uh, against. And um, finally, they have to submit a statement to uh, WinForum and they have to detail, you know, all the tests uh, performed, the test results uh, and, and, um, and uh, any other uh, uh, information pertaining to the I would say the configuration on, on how the test have been uh, performed. Um, next slide, Lee. So at the end of a process, if, if uh, the company does uh, uh, execute all the steps mentioned in the previous slide, then the WIND forum will uh, uh, evaluate all the documentation provided. And uh, if the documentation is deemed appropriate, then the wind forum will uh, record the, the declaration for the company uh, in in a website that the company is uh, self assessing or self testing that it is compliant with certain uh, features so there are two urls specified here one for cbsds and one for the sas where the wind forum will publish the result of self testing and you can see here an example on how this will be recorded. So you can see that uh, there are uh, a list of optional features, and then uh, each company is going to be listed uh, for the CBSD, the FCC ID of a device which has been tested is going to be recorded, and then each of the optional feature is going to be marked uh, as either supported or, or not supported. Um, and the final slide. Uh, Lee, if you can go there, it's just an example of a, a declaration letter. So each company has to uh, basically include the FCC ID of a device which has been tested for compliance with release two, and same for the SAS. So you have a, a very similar but just a very uh, a little bit distinct letter from the SAS then the SAS administrators versus the, the CDSD vendors. And we can open it for questions, Richard. All right, thank you, Virgil. Thanks for giving an overview of those things. Um, do you have any uh, sort of feel of how long that testing procedure will take? Is it is it a long process or is it something that a manufacturer or vendor can do quickly? Um, I think it all depends on the number of supported optional features. I, I think uh, 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 right now, as, as uh, uh, Idan is going to get into into details, uh, there is a very clear test uh, specification for CBSDs, for example, if you take the CBSDs as a unit under test, for example, uh, and, and uh, uh, there, are, there are tests for the mandatory feature, and then there are tests which are for each individual optional feature. So if you just have to pass the mandatory feature, well, then the number of test cases are going to be reduced. But as, as a, a product uh, uh, you know, implements more and more of optional features, then of course, the number of test cases are, is going to increase. However, I, uh, the expectation here is, one, that it's not such a big effort to do the self-testing, and two, as I mentioned before, that this can be done incrementally. So initially, a device might, for example, just uh, claim conformance to a mandatory feature, and then it's going to be recognized 
as a release to compliant device and as as the requirements for customer uh, are, are coming in then the device manufacturer can prioritize which features are most important to them uh, implement them and then execute uh, self-testing and then come and do the report to inform to basically get recognition that they have properly tested those supported uh, subset of optional features all right thank you very much virgil we have a few more questions but we'll hold those for the q a at the end so we want to okay. get through all of the material today our next speaker is Edan Raz. Edan comes to us from Airspan. He is a standard specialist, also been in, in this process for quite a long time. He's going to be addressing the area of how do we do self-testing in relation to CBSDs, uh, the basic radio entity of uh, CBRS. So welcome, Edan. Why don't you talk to us about self-testing in the CBSD? Thank you, Richard. So. Um, so, as you can see in the slide, we start with WinForum release one, right? All the CBSD and domain proxy uh, vendors, as part of their part 96 uh, FCC ID compliance, uh, did the WinForum release one testing in official test labs. For WinForum release one, we had uh, a test specification document, which is WinFTS0122 test and certification for CBRS for CBSD slash domain proxies unit under test. And because this was done uh, in the test labs, then the WinForum also provided a test tool. It was, it's an official WinForum software test harness for CBSD. The version used is 1003, available for public download from the WinForum GitHub. Um, and, and all of the vendors did this in order to claim part 96 FCC ID, FCC equivalent class type CBD. For WinForum release two, as Virgil said, we are taking um, the approach of self-testing. So, um, so first of all, also as Virgil said, the preliminary requirement for CBSD domain proxy is to have part 96 FCC ID prior to executing testing of WinForum release two. Release one is the baseline. You need to, you need to comply anyway. And for release two, the WinForum has done um, a test specification document, WinFTS4004, um, which is the test and certification for CBRS, CBSD slash domain proxies unit under test for release two. But for the test tool, the, because it's self-testing, then it's actually a vendor de self-developed test tool. For now, WinForum does not provide a test harness for CBSD uh, slash domain proxy release to testing. It is also because that currently all the test cases in the current published version of the S4004 document are non-regulatory impact, which do not impact the FCC Part 96 certification. So because everything is self-testing, then um, each vendor, each company has the flexibility to develop its own test tools with its own uh, methodology. If it wants it to be automatic, if it wants it to be manual, um, it's okay. The WinForum is not, uh, doesn't care about this. All the WinForum cares for compliance eventually, as Virgil said, is to follow the test steps properly of, uh, of the TS4004 document and properly claim the pass-fail uh, criteria. Next slide, please. Okay, so, um, so the WinForum so the TS4004 document has the same methodology and structure of the TS0122 document, which was, so 4004 is release two, 122 is the release one. You have the same notation of the test case naming. And uh, for example, in 4004, you have WinFFT C rel2 nri fce.5 or WinF FTD rel2 NRI FC6. So if you recall from 
the release one testing that all the companies did, um, the CND, the C uh, notes a CVSD without a domain proxy, a single CVSD. The D denotes a domain proxy with two CVSDs. And for PS4004 document, those two notations of rel2 indicating this is a release two, or inform release two test, and NRI noting this is a non-regulatory impacting feature. Now, the drawing here, which, uh, which also Virgil showed, exists in TS0122 and also 4004, which is uh, uh, the test uh, setup. There is once, uh, there just one difference. You can see that um, you have the CVSD as unit under test or the domain proxy with two CVSDs as unit under test. You have the RF test equipment, but on the top, instead of a SAS test harness, which in WinForum, uh, which in WinForum release one um, came, came from WinForum itself, here for release two, um, it's a vendor self-testing tool, as you can see. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, as mentioned by, um, by Andy and Naveen and uh, Virgil, for WinForm release two, it is mandatory for CVC domain proxy to support the feature capability exchange. Each CVSD domain proxy vendor decides for its equipment which additional WinForum release two features to implement. This is the flexibility of WinForum release two uh, implementation. Very similar to, uh, to release one to the TS0122 document, we also have for release two in the TS4004 document, two tables, table 6.3 which lists all the test cases with their designation. Release 2M, mandatory for WinForum Release 2 compliance, mainly the feature capability exchange testing. Release 2 optional, completely optional. And Release 2C, uh, conditional, required to execute the test case if CVSD domain proxy supports relevant functionality of WinForum Release 2 feature. So here in the slide, you can see uh, a part of uh, table 6.2. In the actual TS4004, you can see the entire table 6.2 with all uh, relevant functionality. So if I take uh, an example, the last, uh, the last row uh, shown here is, says rel2.c4 for UUT, which operationally supports enhanced group handling. UUT, which supports single frequency group or coalition group or other proprietary group types. So if you decided, if you as a vendor, as a company, decided to implement um, the, uh, the enhanced group handling feature, then you, are, you identify yourself that release 2.c4 is applicable for you. And then you are executing all those test cases that fall under release 2.c4. Um, next slide, please. And here is an example of, um, of table 6.3. Again, this is only um, a snapshot of uh, table 6.3. Table 6.3 has the full list with many, many, many test cases. So um, aligning to to what we said earlier. You can see that the first two rows uh, in this table denote rel2m, which is the mandatory. And you can see in the test case title, um, the first row, which is FTC rel2 NRI FC5. The X is for CBSD. Again, the notation C, which means that this, is, this test is for a single CBSD without a domain proxy. And it's CVC successful feature capability exchange with release to SAS. In this particular case, registration response includes SAS feature capability list with partial match to CVC feature capability list. That's all in the, in the details 
and parameters of the messages themselves. The corresponding test case for the domain proxy is what you see in row number two, which is uh, WinFFTD, rel2, nrifc.6. So you see the X, uh, which is for domain proxy instead of CBSD. You can see um, in the test case title, it's the exact same title, successful feature capability exchange with release to SAS. And the only change is that the first row is CBSD, the second row is DP. Um, the tests are built exactly like the release one, that for test cases that the CBSD, it says just one CBSD in the unit error test. For test cases which domain proxy, it's domain proxy with two CBSDs in the unit under test, and those are really rel 2 m uh, The next two rows are uh, rel 2 c 4 what we discussed from the, from, uh, the table 6.2 in the previous slide. So rel 2 c 4 um, is if you support the, um, the enhanced uh, grouping feature. So again, you can see the two, uh, the two test cases. The first one for CBSD as unit under test, the second one for domain proxy with two CBSDs as unit under test. Again, you see the notation for the for the third row, winfft.c or CBSD rel2 NRI EGH1, EGH notes uh, enhanced grouping. Um, in the upper in the upper two two uh, rows, you see FCE. FCE denotes a feature capability exchange. Um, so you see for the third row, the test case title, CBSD successful grouping param as part of registration release to SAS. Release to SAS operationally supports the group types of the CBSD. And the exact same uh, test case title for domain proxy in the, in the fourth row that you see here in the example. The only difference is CBSD compared to domain proxy. And again, this is exact structure and methodology of the of the access for CBSD as unit under test or domain proxies unit under test is what the is what exists for release one in the TS ones in the TS122 documents. So all the companies uh, that did CBSD or domain proxy testing for release one um, should recognize uh, this format this format from the release one testing so, and it's applicable also for the release two test. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, so again, going, uh, going to an example of a specific uh, test case. Um, so, WINA, so WINF TS4004 test case sequence methodology is similar to win to win FTS0122, the release two methodology is similar to the release one methodology for CBSD domain proxy. You need to start each test case with CBSD slash domain proxy unit under test in unregistered state. And then the CBSD domain proxy unit under test sends the win forum SAS to CBSD request messages. Verify the request messages from UUT are formatted correctly with relevant parameters specified in the test yeah. to determine the pass fail um, criteria for each uh, for each test step. And the CBSD domain proxy internal test receives a Win Forum SAS to CBSD response message. For for release one, the response message came from the Win Forum official. Uh, test harness for release two. Um, it comes from the CBSD domain proxy vendor self testing tool. WinForum for now does not provide a test harness for release two testing. So again, each company or each CBSD slash domain proxy company uh, can build its own test tool uh, in order to accept the request messages and respond with the response messages. And you need to build that test tool again. It can be fully automatic, half automatic, manually, but eventually you need to build your test tool in order to, uh, to, go, to be able to go through uh, the sequence of the test cases correctly 
and to uh, and to understand properly that you can really claim the pass fail uh, the pass fail result properly according to the to the conditions listed in each test step. And of course, because every company chooses uh, what to uh, which features to implement, so each company when it builds its uh, internal test tool only needs to build the relevant test cases for what it supports. So if you so if the company only supports enhanced grouping, then of course you don't need to build in the tool the test cases for the for the CPE CBSD indicator, for example. And as in uh, and as in the release one testing, the last step of each uh, of each test case uh, is verifying the RF conditions of the CBSD slash domain proxy because eventually um, the like in release one the test sequence uh, you started you start in unregistered state but the test sequence give, uh, walks you through to granted state authorized state you're starting to transmit rf at a certain point um, you are not allowed to transmit rf throughout the entire test or until a certain point so the last step is always the RF validation, and this and this also goes back that the CBC domain proxy, even though the features, the WinForum two features, um, are um, you're testing the protocol here, but you are still a transmitting function that that always abides to the to the release one and your Part ninety six certification. So just in the in the example in the slide. It's, uh, it's a test case WinF FTC rel2 NRI EGH1 for CVSD as unit under test. So um, the first step, right? You always start in unregistered. Um, the first step that you see, ensure the following conditions uh, are met for test entry. UT has successfully completed SAS discovery and authentication with SAS test harness. UT is in unregistered state. Step two. UT sends registration request message to SAS test harness. The registration request is in proper format and parameters are within acceptable ranges. Second bullet of step two, CBSD feature capability list is included with feature ID WF ENH group handling. Third bullet, grouping param is included with values according to WINF SSC 0010. Th those are the uh, allowed um, grouping types and group IDs. So, in order to claim pass for this test, uh, for this uh, for this step in the test, and move to the next uh, step in the test, you really need to verify those items that really the registration request came properly and it included the new parameter of release to CBC feature capability list. It in, and it included the WF ENH uh, group handling and the grouping param is included with the relevant uh, group types. That's all part of the protocol messages and parameters themselves. So again, it doesn't matter to WinForum uh, uh, as part of the self-testing methodology. How, uh, how actually the company um, does the does the pass fail criteria with its own self testing tools? If you're doing it manually, if you're reading the message and doing it automatically, it doesn't matter. But the important thing is that when you eventually when you declare to WinForum um, that you really pass the test cases correctly, you really did it correctly. You really verified uh, during the self testing that that the, that when you say pass on this on this step. It's re you really verified those bullets um, properly in the in the step, and then and you continue you continue to the next to to the test case next steps. The test case walks you through um, in this case through authorized until you reach the last step, step fifteen uh, for this test case, which is monitor the RF output of the UUT start start from start of test until UUT transmission. Uh, commences because in the middle somewhere uh, in this case step 12 in step 12 um, the uh, the CBSD unit under test reach authorized state so it says UT does not transmit at any time prior 
to completion of first heartbeat response. And EOT transmit after step 12 is complete and its transmission is limited to within the bandwidth range F. This is exactly, uh, and this is exactly um, like in the release one testing. The last step is the RF. Uh, next slide, please. So exactly the corresponding test case for the domain proxy. So you see WinF FTD denoting the domain proxy, uh, .egh.2. So, um, so you have uh, in the first, um, again, in the first step, UT has successfully completed SAS discovery and authentication with SAS test harness. And again, when we say SAS test harness, it's the wording in the, uh, in the 4004 spec, but for now, Practically, what this means is the vendor self-testing tool. Um, so here's step two. This is for domain proxy. Domain proxy with two CBSDs sends registration request in the form of one two-element array or as individual messages to SAS test harness. Um, and again, like, like the previous slide, the registration request is in proper format and parameters within acceptable ranges. CBSD featured capability list is included with WF ENH group handling, grouping params. And you see in step three, SAS test harness sends registration response message with the following parameters. And you see, because it's a domain proxy, you see two CBSDs. CBSD ID CI, I, I equals one and two for the two CBSDs. Response code zero. And SAS feature capability list, WF ENH group handling, um, and only this feature ID is supported by SAS. So again, the, um, the self-testing tool that each company builds really needs to respond back with a response code zero and only WF ENH group handling as a fee. Then you can you continue to step four. Also, you're testing the conditions of the, of the step, claiming pass-fail, continue the test cases until again, step 15, which is the RF, and the RF in here, because you have two CBSDs, then, uh, then, it's, uh, then you're checking the RF of both CBSDs. As you can see, UT transmit after step 12 is complete, and its transmission is limited to within the bandwidth range FI. I, I, I meaning uh, for one, for the one, two, for the two CDs. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, so the test report of the CBSD domain proxy vendor for TS4004 remains internal for the vendor due to the self-testing policy. And once you finish your testing, uh, as Virgil explained, the CBSD domain proxy vendor can proceed to claim compliance to WinForum release two, according to WinForum CBRS release two self-testing policy as defined in document WinFTS4005. Um, if not mentioned previously, WinFTS4004 is also available on the WinForum uh, website for uh, public data. Next slide, please. And I think that's it. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Idan, and a very good presentation about the self-testing aspects of CBSDs and domain proxies. We'll have a few questions on that, but I'm going to hold them off to allow for our last presenter for today, and then we'll get into any questions that there are. Our last presenter today is uh, Dr. Masood Olfat. He's the Vice President of Technology Development for Federated Wireless. Uh, Masood is going to go through self-testing um, and certification, but in, in his case, he's going to be covering it from the aspect of the SAS. So let me pass it off to you, Masood, and uh, give us an explanation of these things. Thank you very much, um, uh, Richard. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so I can I can start uh, first uh, before talking about the SAS testing. Just mention that uh, I am uh, chairing the the test and certification group work group four and work group four 
has a three task group and which is mainly the objective is to develop the whole test and certification program uh, so one task group is uh, dealing with the cbsc testing and thanks idan to manage that and he explained it another one is uh, dealing with the sas test of a lot of cases and then i'm going to talk about that and, of, and we have another task group under work group four which is in charge of the development of the test code of course for release one day they did a magnificent job and uh, it was chaired by uh, Dr. Kate Harrison from Google. And uh, uh, for now, for release two, because we are not doing any test code development, that's why we have not included in this webinar. Hopefully later on when we do anything about test code development for release two, we'll make sure that uh, uh, Dr. Harrison is also involved. Um, anyway, uh, in terms of the SAS testing, uh, let me just quickly review what we did in release one. Um, uh, in release one, uh, we started with, uh, of course, work group one, work group two, work group three, developed the protocols and requirements. Then work group four, uh, we developed the SAS test cases, uh, both functional and protocol tests included in document uh, TS61. And uh, then the, the work group four test code development task group developed the test suites, including all test harnesses. Uh, then uh, uh, the test harnesses were verified by SAS admins and then uh, became available in the public document, uh, in the public uh, website. Uh, there's a GitHub uh, managed by WinForum. And then uh, ITS, the uh, International Telecommunication, whatever, uh, that is under NCIA, uh, sorry, information, I, I don't recall the, the abbreviation for ITS, is an agency under NTIA. They uh, verified the test codes and uh, then uh, they executed the, te uh, the test for the uh, all, for all SAS admins, way one SAS admins in five different tranches. Uh, actually, ITS was uh, tasked by FCC to uh, manage this process. And then they created the report and uh, reports were reviewed by the SAS admins and finally uh, FCC issued the certification. Uh, as far as I know, uh, this is the timing that, and that the SAS admins were approved. The five SAS admins that has, they have already been approved as part of release one, uh, way, release one, wave one, and uh, Comsco Federated, Google, Sony, Amdocs, Keybridge is in process of being certified. They have passed a lot of aspects. I think, as far as I know, only the ICD, the last step is remain. And uh, as, as far as I know, there are two SAS admins that are looking uh, for uh, wave two certification. Uh, once again, if, uh, uh, if this is this is my understanding, and this is not a legal term, it might be might not be very accurate. So, Lee, uh, can you go to the next page, please? Okay, so uh, for release two, the process that we have is depicted here. Uh, so first of all, we have to make sure that uh, the SAS admin that is being uh, subjected to release two is a past release one, whether wave one or wave two, it doesn't matter. But uh, the prerequisite is that uh, SAS admin should have past release one certification. Then uh, the, uh, we have a few steps, the test, test case development, will be performed by uh, uh, WinForum uh, Workgroup 4, uh, both for NRI and RI test uh, features. Then uh, the test harness code development. For the NRI feature, the expectation is that the SAS admin, this is a proposal and the steering committee has approved it, that the SAS admin would, would, would develop the test code uh, and uh, then the verification of the test harness is done by the SAS admin. The execution of the test is going to be performed by the SAS admin. SAS admin generates the report and provides to WinForum, and finally WinForum issues the certification. And of course, uh, uh, a SAS admin that wants to perform this, they have to abide by the rules that uh, uh, Virgil presented uh, as part of his presentation. And, and it's mentioned in document 4005. For the RI feature, uh, features and RI test cases, uh, the, for now, uh, the, um, it's under discussion, but the, and we don't have any test case right now for RI, but the view is that 
the test harness uh, would be developed by WinForum. The uh, test harness verification would be performed by SAS admin and FCC. And execution would be performed by SAS admin and with possible FCC supervision. And finally, the certification would be done by FCC. And the reason is that these are the features and test cases that would impact the result of the part 96. Um, next page, please. So, uh, thank you. So for now, uh, the workgroup four is looking at uh, two documents, document 4003 uh, to address non-regulatory impacting test cases and document 4006 to address uh, uh, RI. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry that second bullet should be deleted. We'll make sure uh, that is deleted. The test case uh, numbering in uh, in document 4003 and 4006 would follow uh, what I'm putting here. Uh, very similar to release one, we are adding only the release, uh, release X, one or two, and then we are adding NRI versus RI. Uh, all the tests in, in 4003 would include NRI and 4006 would include RI. And two examples that are uh, mentioned here. Uh, and there is no test available for RI yet. Next page, please. Okay, so here is the uh, the list of the features that uh, we have been looking at and uh, we are discussing right now as part of the document 4003. Uh, one of them, uh, the, some tests are addressed by uh, reg registration and they are looking at the registration process specifically from the perspective of a feature capability exchange. We are testing the feature capability exchange process as part of the CVSC registration process. Uh, then we have uh, the test case uh, value of FCE feature capability exchange as explained by Naveen. Uh, we have another protocol message called the uh, feature capability exchange uh, that the CBSD can pe perform any update on the feature capabilities or adding new features or removing features or even change the release uh, while the CBSD is registered and that is uh, called feature capability exchange. Um, we are testing that for the enhanced group handling, uh, we have several test cases that are addressing the general enhanced group messages. <laughs> we have some protocol messages that are addressing uh, the group types, group config, group parameters between CVSC and SAS. And uh, this, these two group of test suites test uh, SAS to handle those uh, protocol uh, messages correctly. Then uh, there is a group of uh, basically one aspect of group handling is the principal subordinate. That is not explicitly tested here. Uh, we haven't done anything at this time. Group might decide to do that test year later. Uh, one example of that principal subordinate is, uh, is CPBTS. Uh, potentially it could be, again, we are not testing that explicitly yet. Uh, the, another example of passive DAS, SFG, the single frequency group, is passive DAS that uh, we are looking at the test cases right now. And that address the handling of passive DAS group as a single frequency group with some restriction on the frequency and the transmission power. Uh, we are doing, we are thinking about both protocol and functional tests for the passive DAS. Uh, we have the concept of coexistence group under the group handling. Again, it's not explicitly tested. And we have the concept of self-coordinating interference group, which is, again, not explicitly tested. And that handles the group of CBSCs handling interference among each other. Uh, another group of test cases are enhanced antenna pattern. And we are uh, putting them as EAP, uh, Naveen and, uh, and Andy explained it. Uh, CP and as well as CP CBSC indicator, we have a test case for that, uh, which is uh, the value is CP. And finally, we have test cases called FAT, which addresses the feature capability exchange among SAS. So uh, the whole uh, concept of feature capability exchange that we uh, discussed, not only it ex exists between the CBSD and the SAS, but it also exists between the SASs and SAS, different SAS. It is very important that a feature, uh, especially if it requires coordination. This is important. For example, uh, the IAP, incumbent protection, DPA, uh, move list calculation, 
they all require coordination among SaaS admins. For those, uh, if, if an, there is an update or a new feature impacting any of those aspects, then we have to make sure that uh, all SaaS admins support that. So for that reason, it is very critical that, uh, or including, for example, the concept of 2D antenna. Uh, so we, we do the feature capability exchange, exchange among SaaS, and we have test cases handling that. Next page, please. Okay, <laughs> I don't want to go through uh, all of them in detail, but um, these are the existing test cases in 4003. Uh, we have, uh, as you see on the left column, uh, we have WinForum, uh, FT is functional test, S is the, on, the unit under test is SAS, uh, release two, NRI, these are all uh, non-regulatory impacting. Um, we have uh, four tests for registration, the testing array, mul array multiple step registration, array single step registration. Uh, people know that the difference between multiple step and the single step is when uh, CP is involved or not involved. Uh, then uh, uh, we have, uh, and in these two test cases, we address the category A and B uh, inclusion or not inclusion of the feature capability exchange in the registration message. In registration tree, we assume that CBSD is sending uh, uh, invalid CP CBSD feature capability list. And finally, we uh, registration number four, we make it uh, uh, configurable. Then uh, uh, in FCE one and two, we are addressing the uh, feature capability exchange request for CBSD, including invalid array uh, feature capability exchange from CBSDs. For FAB 1 and 2, uh, we make sure that uh, the SAS UUT responds to a full activity dump request from the other SASs, as well as uh, the full activity dump pool command by the SAS UUT. So these are the two test cases. And uh, in, in both of them, we only uh, capture the uh, concept of feature capability exchange, not the general FAB. Uh, keep in mind that uh, all other aspect of the FAD has been tested already as part of the release one, including exchanging the CBSDs, the uh, PAL protection areas, and the ESC locations. Finally, um, another test that to be added and we have discussed it is that, uh, as Naveen uh, mentioned, there is a flag in uh, heartbeat response, uh, spectrum inquiry response, and grand response and that flag is used uh, by the SAS to request CBSC to initiate feature capability exchange. For example, if SAS changes the feature or if there is any mis miscommunication or for example, SAS changes the list of features or the release, uh, SAS goes from release one to release two or um, you know, any, any change on the release or any change of the feature, features that supported by the SAS, SAS might uh, initiate that feature. So that's one group. Uh, can you go to the next page, please? Yeah, uh, we have uh, about uh, 12 test cases currently uh, under either approved or under discussion for enhanced group handling. Uh, they're all captured by the EGH, uh, like for example, CBSD exchanging message with group types. Uh, whether they are supported or not, not supported by the SAS, keep in mind that uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that all groups are supported by the SAS. And uh, the SAS in the registration response, it might uh, identify whether that particular group is supported by the SAS or not. Um, uh, number two, uh, test the scenario that CBSC does not send group param. It says, I support. EGH, but I, but doesn't suffer, doesn't send the grouping param. Number three is that uh, when real CBST changes the group, it belongs to uh, on the different messages, uh, not only the registration on different messages. It changes the group that it belongs to. Uh, for, so it says that at the registration, I announced be part of, for example, a CP CBST group, but for some reason uh, my BTS goes out and I need to change to another BTS, then I need to change my group. That is allowable and we are testing that scenario. Of course, uh, every test that I'm talking about is testing SAS behavior in this case. This is not testing CBSD. So CBSD is, uh, is uh, 
simulated as a test harness, is modeled as a test harness. Uh, number four, CBSE sends the grouping param object with incorrect group type, and we test the behavior of the SAS. Number five is that CBSD sends a registration message uh, with a grouping information to a release to SAS uh, supporting EGH. Um, and again, this is a release one. CBSD, keep in mind that in release one, we had one group. It was, it was called co uh, interference coordination. Uh, number six is that the number six, seven, eight, nine are testing the uh, the passive DAS operation uh, through registration, through grant, heartbeat, and a spectrum inquiry. And uh, finally, uh, uh, um, and also number ten is the passive DAS CBSD, basically with changing uh, passive DAS. So. Uh, 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 transmission point TP or antenna belongs to one passive DAS, but for some reason the group is changed. We, we test that. And also the uh, sending incomplete grouping message. And also uh, we are thinking about uh, a functional test. Again, this is under discussion uh, how SAS handles the, uh, the passive DAS elements, uh, making sure all of them are using the same frequency. So this is under discussion that uh, whether we need to put it or if you want, how we are gonna handle it. Next page, please. Uh, other task, test cases that are being addressed here are uh, IP1, IP2, the uh, testing the enhanced antenna uh, pattern. Uh, uh, the IP1 is handling the antenna gain calculation using the release one method by a release to SAS, and then the other one is that antenna gain calculation using a horizontal antenna pattern, and IP3 is handling the uh, antenna pattern calculation with both uh, horizontal and vertical beam width. And number five, four is that using the horizontal and uh, vertical pattern. As Andy mentioned, in release two, we have uh, many different ways that antenna patterns can be handled either by just providing the anten uh, the uh, horizontal and vertical beam width only or providing the full pattern, both uh, uh, horizontal and vertical patterns. So we are we are testing all those scenarios in the uh, and how SAS treats them. And finally, we have a test case for CPE uh, CBSD indicator. it's it's not testing the functionality of the SAS, rather it's testing the uh, support of the protocol for that. Next page, please. Uh, okay, uh, I don't know how much time I do have. I don't wanna really go through, uh, because this is, I, what I did I as a sample test, I included two uh, test cases. One of them is FCE1, and uh, which is the uh, feature capability exchange. Um, and in this case, we are, testing, so let me just give high level and then uh, I don't think I have enough time to go through the detail of that. So basically what we do here, um, it's interesting in the, in the uh, step one, you see uh, some terminologies. It says SAS uh, is, uh, SAS, ad, SAS administrator configures admin test harness with the SAS operationally supported feeds. Feed is, uh, means a feature ID. So basically, uh, we have two sets of feeds. One is the group that SAS supports. It's called operationally supported feeds that is supported by the SAS. There are some features that uh, more than, they have more uh, kind of implications. Uh, and we are calling them operationally supported feeds that require re-registration. Um, I'll explain those. So for example, if there is a, uh, like enhanced antenna. Uh, if uh, if a SAS does not support in enhanced antenna and a CBSD supports that, then at some point uh, a SAS implements that feature. So for some of those cases, uh, the CBSD needs to re-register and provide the, the actual uh, 2D antenna pattern or uh, some other aspects that uh, mainly would be impacted by the, the RI test cases. So we are dividing the features into features that if they are added either by SAS or CBSD, they really require re they require re-registration and some features that they do not require re-registration. So we are separating those. 
and uh, testing the SaaS uh, using the feature capability exchange on those scenarios. So for example, in this case, uh, CBSD 1 and 2 have regist registered, but uh, they have not included CBSD feature capability list in the uh, registration, which means that they are release 1. And CBSD 3 has registered, says it's release 2 because it has included CBSD feature capability. And in the check, of course, we have to make sure that the SAS responds correctly. Now, if you go to the next page, uh, the next step, what we do, we, we have all three SAS admin CBSDs to initiate the feature capability exchange. In this case, uh, CBSD1 uh, includes the CBSD feature capability list in uh, uh, one of the messages but leaves it blank. CBSC2 sends this uh, in one of the messages, but includes a feature that requires re-registration, and CBSC3 adds a new feature that does not require re-registration. So uh, we check the CBSC2 respond, uh, SAS response correctly, and of course, in the next step, it requires SAS expects CBSC2 to re-register because uh, uh, the feature that CBSC announced in the list requires the registration and so the, all the steps and the checks are uh, described here in this test case and i don't want to go through the detail because the time is uh, limited and of course we are specifying for example if you look at for cbsc2 in the check it says that the response code contained in the parameter is 105 requiring deregistration re and of course if cbsc wants they can re-register uh, can I go to next page, please? Uh, I have included a, another example, which is the uh, the EAP2. In this case, uh, we are assuming that uh, a vertical beam width is not provided, an antenna model is provided by the CBSD. Keep in mind that uh, CBSD release two can provide antenna uh, model or antenna pattern in many different ways. One way is besides release one, which is only horizontal beam width and horizontal gain, besides release one, they can provide uh, horizontal beam width and vertical beam width. That's one way. Another way is to provide horizontal and vertical patterns. And another way is that CBSC just provides a model. Uh, and we are gonna have a, a database that includes all antenna models. In other words, CBSC really doesn't have to provide the detailed pattern in the registration. Rather, it provides a, a model, and SAS is expected to be able to access the database and download that uh, full antenna model. So we are testing those aspects in this test case, and I don't want to go through the detail. At the end, uh, we will make sure that uh, SAS calculates the model uh, accurately, uh, within uh, within 0.2 dB, uh, you know the gain can be calculated uh, accurately within 0.2 dB uh, margin. So that's our uh, process for testing the SAS, making making sure that SAS calculates the antenna gain correctly. Uh, next page, please. Uh, this is my lab. Oh, this is uh, this is extra. I'm sorry. This should be deleted. Next page, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is my last page. Uh, for the RI testing, for now, we don't have any test case for RI, for SAS. Um, but, uh, and of course, uh, working group four is kind of following what work group, working group one and three does. Uh, for now, the features that are being discussed, uh, by the way, uh, I, need to, I need to add, the enhanced antenna pattern that we discuss currently, it is expected that it's only used for the GAA uh, coexistence perspective because it's NRI. Uh, however, whenever we decide to use the enhanced antenna pattern for incumbent protection, and as Andy mentioned, we are discussing with, with FCC on that, uh, then it's going to be considered an RI feature, and uh, we are going to test that correctly. And in that case, we might include some aspect of incumbent protection in the test. And there is discussion going on on the grant update optimization in work group. It was approved in work group one. It is being discussed in work group three. Uh, we are, there is a discussion going on around IAP optimization uh, for some scenarios. And finally, 
there is some adjustment on the IHATA that uh, identified by the uh, test development group uh, under work group four that we need to we need to adjust that. So these are the ones again that under discussion and uh, work group four is not going to do anything until work group one and work group three finalize the uh, requirement and protocol. And I think with that, uh, I am done. Uh, thank you very much for your patience, and I'll be happy to hear questions. Great. Thank you, uh, Masood, and appreciate the great overview of the SAS side of things. Uh, we have come to that point in our webinar where we've concluded the formal presentations. Uh, we have a few questions. If our panelists can come back on, uh, we can answer as many of those as possible. Uh, the first question has to do with timing and how long uh, and when we might expect that uh, release to self-certified um, features and functions would go into effect, uh, both on the CBSD side uh, or CBSD slash DP side and the SAS side. Uh, somebody want to address timing for us. Yeah, maybe I can take it, Richard. All right, Virgil. Yeah, so from WinForum perspective, uh, on the CBSD side, all the technical specification and the test specification has been have been published. So basically, on the CBSD side, there is a, a, a mandatory feature as well as uh, the optional features which have which have been already published in the TS 4004. Uh, they're ready to be self-certified. So any company which uh, have uh, implemented those features can run the test cases and provide the wind forum the required documentation uh, to certify those uh, compliance with those features so um, it's, it's basically Especially, for example, for the group handling and specifically passive that that we do a lot of the for, but not on those features can be used for testing. Um, for for us, as is concerned, uh, my your pilot. My expectation is that in the next week, we finish the first review and request the leave part of the document. Uh, the whole process, including uh, the rebalance and providing comments and then, uh, reviewing those back for the for the for uh, if we start that in the worst case, uh, within two to three weeks, I believe that the rebalance process includes not one and a half to two months. Um, so, uh, given given all the my expectation is sometimes of, of do 
2022, 2021, I can expect that the existing NRI features, the test cases for NRI features uh, will be finished. And uh, because we are not having the test codes developed by WinForum, I think the World War IV job will be ended by developing the test cases for NRI for the SAS and CBS. So, Lee, any, uh, do you think that, like, the, for balloting, that sometimes middle or toward the end of Q2 would be a reasonable? Lee, you are mute. Yeah, on mute, Lee. Sorry, try that again. Uh, yeah, that aligns with process. So, for uh, I think we can say that you know we're we're open for business for CBSDs. Um, they can go ahead and um, uh, allow to have features that they're supporting listed, and then the SASs, um, as we as Masood said, uh, sometime in Q2, this the SASs will be able to support that as well. Of course, in order to deploy it, you need both the SAS and the CBSD. Both have to be done. Um, but um, the, the CBSDs start on, on those, uh, on those uh, uh, testing now. We had another question um, sort of looking to extend uh, where CBRS is going. Uh, this, they asked about the discussion of uh, CBSDs and DPs, but asked whether or not we expect um, there to be any extension to mobile devices. Um, and of course, right now, Part 96 covers, at least for CBSDs, all fixed devices. Um, I, I don't know if you want to comment about anything having to do with mobile devices. Yeah, I don't, Richard. This is Andy. I don't. Uh, I don't see any possibility of mobile devices anytime in the near future. That they were specifically excluded in the rules uh, for a reason. They make interference management a lot harder. Uh, so I, I don't see that happening anytime. All right. Thank you. The, the Next question was that um, the comment I made in the in in the chat was that EUDs are can be mobile. But not CBSDs. Anything that's managed directly by the SAS has to be fixed. Right, and and EUDs are not uh, do not go through the SAS, so um, that would be a different uh, management situation. But anyways. I think it's worth mentioning that the end user devices or EUDs are indirectly controlled through the CBSDs. I mean, you know, that's why the CBSD has a very rigorous uh, requirements when to stop transmitting in order to get the EUDs of the air as well. Yeah. They are indirectly controlled, but there is no uh, direct technical specification for, for end user devices, and the CBSDs are not allowed to be mobile. So uh, next question has to do with CPE CBSDs and whether or not their operation or use is considered regulatory impacting. Uh, does somebody want to speak about uh, not only CPE CBSDs, but maybe a little more detail on what's regulatory impacting versus non-regulatory impacting? I get a lot of questions on that. So Richard, I can say a couple of words. Um, Andy? Yeah, thanks. So CPE CBSD is not regulatory impacting, and the reason is it's already provided for in release one. Um, it's already provided for under the existing FCC rules in sort of an indirect way. The, the rules themselves don't address CPE, CBSD, that is like bootstrapping registration with the SAS. Um, but after the rules were issued, the FCC issued a knowledge database, a KDB entry that clarified that that type of operation is allowed. So CPE CBSDs are already authorized under release one uh, and under the existing FCC rules. So in release two, all we're doing is adding the ability to identify yourself explicitly as a CPE CBSD, which may come in handy in some situations. Um, so, so it is not, um, not regulatory impacting just because it's already allowed. So an example of a release two feature could be or couldn't be regulatory impacting depending on the application is, for example, enhanced antenna paths. So if you rely on a TV antenna to 
protect an incumbent like the DOD or a fixed satellite service dish, that is regulatory impact because our current certification does not allow for TV antenna patterns to be used. Uh, so we'd have to go back and request certification to be allowed to use TV antenna patterns to protect incumbents. On the other hand, if a SAS implemented the use of 2D antenna patterns for coexistence between two GAA devices, where the FCC rules don't even allow, don't provide for any interference mat, uh, management among GAA devices, but if a SAS as a value add wanted to use a 2D antenna pattern to manage interference among GAA devices, it could do that, and that doesn't impact any regulations because we're not required to provide interference management within the GAA tier anyway. So that's just one example of where a particular feature could or might not be regulatory impacting just depending on how you use it. All right, uh, thank you, Andy. I want to turn to what's on the screen for just two seconds. If you want to find information on the enhanced features um, in release two, you can come to the uh, WinForum uh, website and uh, we want to scroll down a little bit and show them there. Yeah, so if you go to the Web Forum website uh, and you click on the, the CBRS link, uh, it'll take you to this home page. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think we lost you. Yeah, let me all these audio comes back on. There. Can you hear me? See me? Audio bag. Uh, what Lee is showing you is, is that when you come to this page, you can see a see a base specifications with least one specifications, and then uh, you can transition over to the release uh, specifications as well in here. All right, um, I think we're going to wind up for today. We have a few um, more questions. We will get back to you offline uh, um, if you're and certainly always along the way. Uh, there was a question about when release three will come out. Um, we we don't have a, a specific plan for timing on release three yet, but I applaud the question because it's very forward looking, um, and we're always looking to have more um, and more participation. Um, I want to thank our team for today. We had quite an esteemed group of people, Lee Pucker, Andy Clegg, Naveen Hathramani, Virgil Simpu, Eden Raz, and Masood Wolfat. I'm Richard Bernhardt, your moderator, and we look forward to bringing you further webinars as things arise in CBRS. Thank you, everybody, for attending today. Go forth, be safe, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you. <laughs>